I'm here with Brian Cuban. Brian, thank you so much for being with me. Thanks for having me on, Zach. So I want to talk to you about what we were just talking before, uh, before we started recording. I'd love to talk to you about anything and everything that's you, because that's sort of how I think about addiction anyway, the whole gestalt. But specifically, your experience with um, eating disorders, which people have been asking um, over and over again, time and time again, if we could have somebody on and talk about that experience. And so you're, you're a great candidate for all of those things. And I'm wondering if maybe you could tell people a little bit about who you are and your background and how you came to be interested in, I guess, let's just say addiction and mental health sure. overall. Sure. Uh, I'll give you a, a Reader's Digest and then we can take it. <laughs> Uh, we can take it as deep as you want to take it down the Sounds hole. Good. But uh, yes, I'm in. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I live in Dallas, Texas, non-practicing lawyer. I no longer practice. I grew up in Pittsburgh, PA. I uh, went to Penn State and then the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. I am in long-term recovery from traditional bulimia, uh, exercise bulimia, and we can talk about what that is, uh, cocaine addiction, uh, alcohol use disorder, quote unquote alcoholism. And I put it in air quotes because that's not a diagnosis. It's, a, mm. it's kind of a label and uh, steroid addiction. So I clinical depression. Uh, so a number of, I, I battle clinical uh, major depressive episodes. So the whole gambit, nothing unique, except maybe the eat, people might view the eating disorders as unique, but they're really not about uh, 30 to 50% of all those who uh, suffer from eating disorders are in fact male. And uh, we, we tend to look at it as a quote unquote female uh, disorder. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But and then I've also struggled with body dysmorphic disorder. And what body dysmorphic disorder is, is when someone takes a perceived or even non-existent uh, defect in their, that they see in their, they think they see in their reflection, whether it's the mirror, or the, a window or wherever. And they exaggerate it in their mind to the point where it affects their ability to function, quote unquote, normally in life. Uh, it has a very high correlation to suicide. It has a high correlation to eating disorders. Many people confuse body dysmorphic disorder with an eating disorder. It is not. Mm. It is part of the obsessive compulsive syndrome in the uh, DSM-5. I think we're in the DSM-5 now. And so, uh, and it has a high correlation to steroid addiction uh, and, and a number of a number of mental health issues. And so I will, uh, I've struggled with that. And as far as the traditional disorders, I will be in long-term recovery 14 years tomorrow, April 8th. Excellent. And so what does that mean for you? I know people have to find that differently. For, for drug and alcohol, for me, that means that I have not done a line of blows since April 8th, 2000, uh, 2007. I have not taken a drink for April 8th, 2007. I have not binged in purpose since April 8th, 2007. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. So how did that, I guess, to maybe we could get all of the sort of destructiveness in one messy pile and sort it out uh, through the conversation, but sure. how did these sorts of things come about? I mean, I know you're saying you're sort of, you were sort of compulsive generally or obsessive compulsive generally, and that well, maybe is sort of correlated with some of the behaviors you Maybe, had. but you have to remember, I, I just give that, I gave that for context so people sure. understand that it's not an eating disorder. It's part of the obsessive compulsive disorders uh, umbrella sure, when you're sure. talking about a pure diagnosis of course but uh there's no one you, you life that life is full life to me is an accumulation of snapshots right mm. uh a lot of those snapshots are traumatic so they the traumatic snapshots build from the day you were born and are able to perceive those things until i sit here today and they some of them build build little houses that go this way. Some of them, you know, build little houses that go that way. Do you still and see your get, traumas? By the, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I, I'm going to no, forget this but, if I don't ask. Um, do you still see your traumas as trauma? I mean, do you still, let's see, harbor those and stew on them as traumas, let them bog you down ever? Or do you see those as just like as things that happened to you that were adverse things that you were able to build upon? They were, I see curious. them as adverse childhood experiences that I use to hopefully teach others, but do, well, I think of uh, the fact that I was physically assaulted over my weight mm. and uh, stripped of my pants, down of my underwear in a busy street. Do I think of that and it triggers me into a major depressive, uh, depressive episode? Absolutely not. Uh, these are experiences that I have processed, that I still process in therapy, uh, that I use to hopefully uh, educate about my path and 
the opportunities available for healing? So the answer is no, I do, do not. But do you I feel don't like, even forget them. Right, trauma right, remembers, right, right. right? We remember trauma a lot easier than we remember pleasure. Mm. Uh, so, you know, they say, uh, I mean, you may not remember a sexual experience that was great at 18, but you'll remember, you know, being beaten by a parent. Mm. Uh, we remember pain. So not that my parents did that. They didn't. Uh, let's clarify that. <laughs> there was other kinds of trauma. Fair but I, we have to go back to, you have to go back to the baby boomer era in Pittsburgh, PA. Uh, growing up, I'm, I'm, I'm 60. I'm a baby boomer. Back when cell phones were two cups attached to a string <laughs> and social networking was playing kickball and dodgeball on the basketball court on the blacktop. I'm in the middle of three boys. My older brother, Mark, people know Shark Tank and the Dallas Mavericks. And then I have a younger brother, Jeff. And Mark, as you might expect, was very outgoing. He was uh, very, even at a young age, very entrepreneurial, selling this door to door, selling that door to door. I remember our local newspaper went on strike and he and his buddies, barely old enough to drive, drove from Pittsburgh to Cleveland, which is about 200 miles, bought their newspapers and drove them back to Pittsburgh and sold them on a street <laughs> corner for twice what they paid for him. And this was at 16 years old. <laughs> That's so, outstanding, man. I was gonna, I thought you were going to say that he started writing his own paper because they went no, on strike. Right? <laughs> so he was able to see a need and fill a void back then. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. My, my younger brother, Jeff, was very uh, a good-looking kid, outgoing, uh, nationally ranked wrestler. In high school, uh, the jocks, the beer parties, and the the prom, all those things, and those were the things that I associated with love and acceptance and popularity. This is we've got. You have to remember, this is before Al Gore invented the internet, and uh, and uh, yes, that's a joke. And uh, and you. so <laughs> my I did, this was my images were the people I saw every day, right, of popularity and things like that. And unfortunately, the people going to the prom, the date, your first kiss, and I, and I was classic middle child syndrome. Mm. I was shy, I was withdrawn, and I internalized everything negative said to me and about me and wore it as who I was, like a skin tight suit. That's the snapshot of Brian at, at 13 and 14 years old. And unfortunately, I also had a difficult relationship with my mom. And I'll tell you a little bit about this, but I want to make it clear to all of your listeners, viewers, that I do not blame my mother for the things I went through. Parents do not cause eating disorders. Parents do not cause addiction. There is a difference between cause and correlation. And so although things can go, at home, go on at home uh, that can correlate with mental health issues, that doesn't mean they cause them, right? right. It means some people will suffer it, some people won't. That's correlation. Uh, there was a lot of fat shaming in my household. Uh, I used to come home from school and I'd be eating Chef Boyardee ravioli out of the can. And my mother would come home from selling real estate. She would see me doing that and she would say, Brian, if you keep eating that way, you're gonna be a fat pig. Now, these were the things my mother's mother said to her. These mm -hmm. were the things my great grandmother said to my grandmother. I come from a uh, uh, Eastern European Jewish family, the old country, we had, there were very dysfunctional relationships around food. I mean, my grandparents over there struggled for food, right? So that tends to happen. Mm. And it all runs downhill. And my, my, my mother struggled with her own mental health issues. My grandmother struggled with her mental health issues. My mother had a very uh, volatile, verbally and mentally abusive relationship with her mother. And so as a young mother in the 70s, when we didn't talk about these things, there was, you didn't go to counseling. It just ran downhill. A woman going to counseling in the seventies, if you admitted depression, you could be institutionalized. Mm. And so, and that was, and that's not therapy, is that right? right? I mean, institution uh, in the classic, uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest sense. So she had and her so, own difficulties. Yes. And so uh, I grew, as you might've, as you might expect, it hurt me a lot to hear these things. And I got it at school too. I was a heavy kid bordering on obese, a lot of bullying, a lot of fat shaming. And I began to eat more Chef Boyardee ravioli and more. And I became a bigger Brian and a bigger Brian. And then the bullying really started at school is what happens when kids change for what other kids perceive in the negative. And it happens then, it happens now. Only back then, if 10 kids knew about it in the lunchroom, that meant it went viral. Mm. Uh, now it's different. But it all culminated one day, this bullying, and what I call the day of the gold pants act. My brother Mark, and this was the mid 70s, 76, 77, had given me a pair of shiny gold bell-bottom disco pants. 
Have you seen Saturday Night Fever? Which I was Jackson? just I was just about to ask. <laughs> yeah, that's I, that's yeah, the picture I have was, in my mind. This was during the disco craze. My brother Mark bought disco actually, mm -hmm. and uh, and they were these kind of John Travolta ish pants that he had worn, and he gave them to me. But Mark wasn't a big guy. They they you know girth wise they fit him fine. I had to jump up and down, spray the water bottle. My butt looked like fifteen cats back there, but I didn't care because my brother gave me these shiny gold bell bottom pants and I was gonna wear them to school every day. They were these satin type pants. And the kids made fun of them and I didn't care. And I developed a very self-deprecating sense of humor and became kind of a sad clown. They'd say, Brian, you know, your gut's hanging out. You, you need to go to Sears and robe up back when that Sears was a thing and mm -hmm. get a bra. And I laughed it off because in my mind, these were the popular kids, the good looking kids, the kids holding hands, kids getting their first kiss. And I wanted that so badly. I wanted to be accepted, like many kids do. And uh, But they were also, some of these kids were bullies, but they were popular bullies. So I kind of hung around on the outside of the group, hoping that it was like a hazing. If I just took it long enough, I would be part of them, and I would be invited into the group. But that's not how bullying works, does it, is it? I'm walking home with these kids one day and wearing my shiny bell-bottom gold disco pants. A mile, it's a mile walk. And we're on the sidewalk on a busy street and they start making fun of them. And they decide among themselves that I'm just, I look too ridiculous in these pants to wear. And they physically assaulted me on the sidewalk, tore the pants off me, ripped them into shreds and threw them out in the busy street. Down in my Fruit of the Loom tidy whities my Keds tube socks and tennis shoes, my Pirates t-shirt, my Pittsburgh Pirates t-shirt. And they went on like they had done the funniest thing ever. I went out in the street and I gathered up the shreds and I covered up my tidy whities and waddled home. People gawked. No one stopped. And I got home, Zach, and I, there was no one home. I went down in the basement and then the wooden stair stairs. I was afraid that even if the stairs creaked, that the whole world would know my shame. And I'm going down there and I took those shreds and I put them at the bottom of the garbage, hoping that that, was, that would hide my shame, that no one in, in the world would ever know about it. And... We talk about snapshots, let's click that. That's a snapshot of trauma. And it's a snapshot that I remember. And it's a snapshot that is so vivid in my mind that I can go to that spot in uh, the suburb of Mount Lebanon outside of Pittsburgh, PA today and show you ex within 10 feet, 20 feet where it happened, where they did that to me. And we talk about bright line moments in our path of trauma. It was around then that I remember looking in the mirror and seeing somebody different or believing there was somebody different, not a visual delusion, but an overpowering feeling. Because body dysmorphic, we talk about delusions and it's really an overpowering feeling that there was this monster in the mirror mm. who would never be loved, never have a date, never get a, never have a kiss and all of these things. So it's more than just, um, I think that that's something that's interesting for people to think about is that the delusion is not necessarily only that your body looks different than you think it does it's more the the story that you that comes with what you're looking at and that's right we have to be careful yeah. when we say delusion because when i say delusion i don't mean that i look in the mirror and saw actually saw somebody did different you know saw this monster as a as a physical being it's an overpowering feeling uh, and upset. This is why it's part of obsessive compulsive disorder. It's an overpowering feeling that it, that's not me. Okay. This is, this is a monster. This is ugly. And this is not worthy of love. This, that it, it's this, and it, it's a feeling that just stays inside you and builds up and explodes into a behavior you have to release. So, and then it's nine times out of 10, it's a destructive behavior. So that was the first moment, that's the snapshot. So as you might imagine, I was very happy to get out of Pittsburgh. I went on to Penn State University. It was gonna be a whole new Brian. This is 1979 going to 1980. Uh, most of your listeners probably weren't born yet, but uh, I was very, it was gonna be, I was gonna make new friends. I was gonna, uh, you know, it was just gonna be a different life. It was gonna be, it was gonna be different in my mind. I was ready. My father drove me up out there and it's, uh, we're, I'm in a dorm with four other people, with, or with three other guys. 
and we're unpacking and I'm looking out in the window into the parking lot of my dormitory. And I make eye contact with this curly brown haired girl. And I start sweating, Zach, the sweating bullets come. And I imagine within 10 seconds, my entire life with this girl, we're gonna get married, we're gonna date, we're gonna get married and we're gonna have two and one half children. And she looks at me, she looks at her friends, she looks back at me, puts her hands over her mouth and shouts, ugly, ugly. Mm -hmm. Now, I am not the first teenager to have a nasty thing said to him. Another kid may have put his hands up like this and yelled ugly back. Another kid may have flipped her off or what? another kid may have said whatever. But we all respond based on our genetic, social, environmental uh, molding at that, to, to a, at that time. I was somebody who already felt ugly. And I'm not blaming this girl. It would have been, if it's not this, it's that. It, the triggers in the environment are in the millions, probably billions over our lifetime. So, but I remember thinking, bright line moment number two, snapshot, because I remember it, right? And thinking that my entire life was out of control. I would always be ugly. How can I not be ugly? How can I win the acceptance of those bullies? How can I win the acceptance of this brown haired, curly, beautiful girl by becoming thinner? So to frame that, it's like you were, you had this idea that your hope was that you could clutch on to this relationship with peers such that you could be involved and contextualize in a, in a peer group. And then, and then that was negatively reinforced by, this, you know, something that happened to you. You were given a gift. It was clothing from your brother that was literally ripped to shreds. And so, and then it also kept that, you know, moment in your mind that not only weren't you accepted, but the thing also that you were given that was meaningful to you was gone. You're looking in the mirror, thinking of yourself as ugly, not good. And then yeah. that's becomes real. It's the beginning of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Story, absolutely. Right? absolutely. And that, that, that's, that's a good, that's a good analysis. And, uh, and it also that I was incapable. I wasn't worthy of, of even my family's love because I couldn't, I didn't know how to stand up to bullies, right? I had let mm. this, I, I had let this, this symbol go and I didn't know how to stand up to bullies. And we can talk about that because it turned into something interesting, if you want to, at Penn mm. State, my first year at Penn State. Yeah, I'm interested. Uh, I turned into the worst bully imaginable my first year at Penn State. Mm. I bullied my, uh, one of my college roommates mercilessly because he was like me. And in my mind, if I bullied him in the eyes of our two other roommates who wanted both of us out because they were popular and they, you know, in my, and so in my, I wanted to be one of them. They really were like the bullies in school who wanted us out. So if I bullied my college roommate enough, they would see, hey, I'm like you. That is what that turned me into my first year in college. And it was interesting when I wrote my first book, Shattered Image, I wrote about that and uh, all I remember about this guy is he wore Hawaiian shirts and we called him Hawaiian Dan. And Hawaiian Dan, if you're listening, I'm sorry. And I wrote about it in my, uh, in my first book as well, that I just, if I knew how to find him, I would reach out and just tell him how sorry I am for what I did. But, uh, that is, but I can't change the past. And that is what happened. And I began to restrict my food intake and restrict and restrict. And before I knew it as a, uh, now going on 18 year old freshman at Penn State University in 1979, before Karen Carpenter passed away in 1983, bringing eating disorders into the pre-digital national spotlight, before anyone was talking about eating disorders for men, <laughs> I, I developed uh, anorexic type behavior. It, back then it would have been called ednos, eating disorder not otherwise specified. There's another clinical name for it now and it escapes me. But uh, I quickly, all, I quickly transitioned into bulimia from there, binging and purging. And I started losing weight and every pound I lost was another day that I would be more, that that girl would like me, that I would be accepted, that my two roommates who hated my guts would wanted me out, would accept me. And it became a vicious cycle of binging and purging. And I would go in the, uh, the we had communal restrooms in the dorm and I flushed the toilet and do all the things to camouflage it. Uh, and every time I binged and purged, Zach, I felt like this feeling of peace came over me, almost like a cocaine high, mm. uh, that everything was going to be okay. The next day I would be accepted. I would be loved. The next day I would love myself. 
But then the feeling left and the shame swooped in. The shame of engaging in an app that I did not understand, that I could not define, but I just knew that guys didn't stick their fingers down their throat and throw up. That's not what men do. That is how I transitioned into an eating disorder. So you, the idea of acceptance was so meaningful to you that you were able to put your energy and weight into doing one thing you thought could get you, you know, gain you access to that sort of a lifestyle. Acceptance can be a very powerful driver to, for both good and bad. Sure thing. It can be, and uh, that's not, that's an issue. I mean, that is part of the human condition, right? That's not an issue uh, unique to 1979. Sure, that's right, issue, right. I uh, totally agree. That goes on with everyone. I mean, at, on some level or another. Totally. Uh, we, as human beings, we want to be loved and accepted. That drive, that's part of our driver, uh, biological drive. I totally agree. And the, the, actually, the thing I'm thinking about is that to some greater or lesser extent, people are familiar with that cycle, even if it's, you know, it could be a more trivial kind of a cycle, or it could be even more destructive one where you put your energy into something and sort of box out other ways of generating positive experiences in your lives. And you, and you just, you know, focus Absolutely. so hard on that thing. Yeah. And I that's, think that's where a very I natural think thing. obsessive compulsive nature comes in. I got to have this. I got to have this. As an interesting illustrator of that, uh, I would go down to the infirmary. We didn't have medical, these huge medical facilities back then. I would go down to the infirmary and weigh myself three times a day. Mm. And I remember getting a, a, another snapshot. I remember glancing a look at my chart and the nurse had made a notation that Brian is weighing himself, you know, in a manner that seems abnormal, uh, but they didn't know how to define it. This was 1979 going on. They didn't know what it was. You didn't have the training in eating disorders that you have today. So it's almost like, oh, Brian has this weird tick where he comes and weighs himself all yeah, the time. Exactly. What I'm exactly. Making this. So they saw it and they felt it was not quote unquote normal, but they didn't have a label for it. So that I, I remember that. And so where does the, um, I'm trying to think about the timeline. I have. This would have been going into 1980 now. And so when, is this before uh, your relationship with drugs and alcohol began yes. in a destructive way? Uh, around 19, I, 1980, going into 1981, I'm junior, uh, sophomore, my junior year at Penn State. Uh, I began transitioning into uh, problem drinking. Uh, turned 21. And I was at a branch campus my first year at Penn State, which out near EPA. So you really, it was, you know, unless you were, we had what were called grain your brain parties where people would get bottles of grain alcohol and stuff, but you really didn't have the access to alcohol that we had at main campus at University Park. So started going to the state stores and before I knew it, uh, I don't have a bright line moment there. It was a transition. Uh, I was uh, going to the state store and buying bottles of tequila, putting it in my boot, my sock and going into the going out alone and drinking in alleys, uh, swigging the tequila in alleys to get drunk, to go into the bar and get drunker by myself, drinking mm -hmm. alone. I was drinking alone as an 18 and 19 year old. I'd already started drinking alone. And I started, I ended up going to class uh, intoxicated. I ended up uh, going to class hungover. I was drinking almost completely alone. Uh, I had no, I mean, I had no friends that I can remember at Penn State. It was a very difficult time for me. Uh, not a lot of people look back at their college experience and say, yeah, yeah, we party. I don't look at my four years at Penn State that way. I feel uh, like I forced you into skipping something. To, is, this, is this while you have an eating disorder? Yes. You're, and so you're also drinking. Yes, and so I'm that's sort of the back and forth. Yes. Got gotcha. you. Yes. Gotcha. Because I wasn't getting, when I look back at it, I wasn't getting, I mean, what I needed from binging and purging because the uh, feeling right. wasn't, uh, when, when, the, when the moment was gone, I was, I was ashamed. So I guess looking back, it was okay. You can mute your shame with alcohol. Right. If you, you know, I'll just not feel anything. Gotcha. And, and I had also started running excessively, Zach. I was running 10 miles a day, 20 miles a day, uh, because the only time I felt okay is alone, just alone. I, I felt, and this was the body dysmorphic disorder at work. I'm in a campus of what, 50,000, 60,000 people. And every one of them was looking at me saying, you are a fat pig and will never be accepted. That's what body dysmorphic disorder does to you. 
uh, Penn State, uh, they had a good football team, and, uh, the, and you would draw 100,000 people into the stadium. It was so stressful to me to watch people walking to the games, to these Saturday games, with their dates, with their friends, mm -hmm. with their cliques. It was so stressful to me to even see that, that I would go out on these 20-mile runs in the morning. So I didn't even have to watch them having fun and be alone. And I could return when the game was over. So it's not that, even like, uh, it's not even alone in a crowd as that saying goes. It's more like you're in a crowd that's all turning toward you and, and if, judging. If, my, judgment. if I sat, I, went, I, went, I, would, I went to a football game and I sat in that, I sat in that arena, that stadium of 100,000 people. And I was just, oh. It would, because they're all having fun and, and I'm alone. And, and, and that's how I felt. That's how I felt. They're just like in high school, the girlfriends, the, the cliques, and, and I'll never have that. And it just reinforced. And they're all looking at me and saying, why, do, why are you here? And of course, that's not what's going on, but that's what, my, that's what body dysmorphic disorder can do to a person. Hmm. And so that is how I spent four years at Penn State. And I developed into, and I quote unquote, alcoholic alcohol use disorder would have been as it would have been diagnosed. It's interesting. The closest I ever came to any epiphany, self-awareness on recovery was I walked into, I believe it was a white tower, a white castle, a hamburger joint. I can't remember something like that at Penn state. Uh, if they didn't have them there, I'm sorry. I don't remember the exact one, but uh, there was a rack of pamphlets and I was drunk of course. And there was a rack of pamphlets put out by the 12 step groups. And for, Keeping with the 11 tradition, I'll just say that the most well-known 12-step group is AA, uh, but there are others. So, and there was the 20 questions, and the 20 questions were geared towards college students. Do you black out? Yes. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm checking off yes to all these boxes. Come, you know, you come see us. Come, come, come see us. And I curled it up, my tryout for the Mavericks. I'm just a college student. I don't have a problem. That was as close as I came. And, and so that was uh, that that defined my life at Penn State. Mm. I was a criminal justice major. I wanted to be a police officer. That would have worked out well. I'd have been the first guy in the evidence room training out the man at all for the blow. <laughs> you got you. Uh, so you're, you're wrapping your identity around these negative concepts still. And fair enough. Right. Because it's like it is sort of defining so much of your life if you're not binging, purging, you're drinking, and if you're not drinking, you're running. A lot well, of those behaviors. Yeah, yeah. It was my, ask, ask people, ask right, other your, people who suffer from an eating disorder, right? It just yeah. becomes your identity. That's what, that's what I mean. That's your entire essence is, is that. Yeah. And at the same time, somehow it seems you've, you were able to graduate college. You moved through those channels. I did. Um, man, that's hard to, it's hard to think about how that, you must have had some drive in you to to get you to some sort I of success now drive that i wanted to graduate but uh, yeah, yeah. I really but as far as existing yeah uh, i really couldn't see beyond my nose i guess uh, what i mean is what what do you what kept you from just going all into oblivion only and uh, keeping up with some piece of life maybe not wanting to disappoint my parents or my brothers uh my family that I had to graduate because they had put their money into it and things like that. And my father, my father fixed cars. Uh, mm. We were not, you know, contrary to popular belief, we were a very uh, middle class, uh, working class family. Uh, people see Mark and think, you know, whatever they think. But no, my father cut, uh, put uh, put uh, uh, seats on cars. It's called a trim shot from the end of the Korean War until his brother passed away in '99 for over 40 years that was our life very working class and so, so it wasn't necessarily so for your for, it wasn't uh, yeah right it wasn't necessarily for your own achievement like yeah. you respect yourself so much i have to do this it's more like that huh. your family idea eastern european family idea of things are scarce and you know you need to be grateful for and take it you know don't I, take I, advantage I didn't, I didn't want to disappoint my family and so uh and also i for whatever i mean it was good i also had the ability to pull it together for an evening before an exam, study all night, show up at the exam, and do okay. It's a straight, it's a straight, it's a it's a straight percentage grading, mm. so you can give give the information back. And and I had no, I wanted to be a police officer, but uh, 
you know, that was just kind of the default. And it all kind of switched when I was sitting in the placement office of Penn State my junior year and flipping through police officer jobs through this little book. We had these little pamphlets. And there were two guys who were sitting next to me from Pittsburgh, who I knew because we had the same major, obviously. And they were talking about taking the law school admission test, the LSATs. And I'm listening mm-hmm. to them. And the bells start going off in my head. Not the bells of I wanted to be a lawyer. I had no concept of what that meant. I didn't know any lawyers. I didn't really care about it. Uh, the bells of I can stay in school. Law school is three years. I can stay in school three more years, not have to go out into the world, and I can binge and purge. I can run. I can drink. And I can continue the exact same survival behaviors that got me through four years at Penn State. That was my thought process. Not a good thought process for going to law school. And that is why I went to Pitt Law. Hmm. That's it. Your motivation was you could keep it going. Yeah. My, my motivation was survival. Yeah. Not being a lawyer, not advancement, survival. Very interesting. I didn't have to give up my identity if I stayed in school three more years. Did your brother and his, well, I don't know if he would define it as success or not, but I I see it as success. success. (laughs) Yeah. How how did that feed into or ameliorate or both your relationship with drugs, alcohol, your body, all those things? Yeah. Fair question. Well, and we're also jumping ahead. So yeah, that was just going to say that maybe that's, that's like okay. Let's, let's, let's jump ahead. Let's jump okay. ahead. Uh, I did my first line of cocaine in the uh, summer of 1987. I was already a quote unquote alcoholic. I still had the eating disorder. Mark didn't make, come on to the national, international scene. He was known in Dallas, obviously, mm-hmm. but from the standpoint of the Mavericks and things like that, that was 2001. Okay. It was 2000, 2001. So you can't say that that had caused, you know, had a strong correlation. It had zero correlation because I was already dealing with all of these things beforehand. Decades earlier. Okay. Yeah. But there's a big but here. At that time, I had no identity of my own. I hated myself. I was just, I had failed the bar multiple times. I was uh, cocaine and alcohol. I mean, I was really in a hole. I had multiple divorces at that point, all Mm -hmm. around uh, alcohol uh, and drugs. And so since I had no identity of my own, when he became nationally famous, internationally famous, all of a sudden, girls like me, girls half my age like me, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I could walk into through any line. All of a sudden, people were walking up to me and stuffing cocaine in my pockets and, and nightclubs. Hmm. I don't, I don't know who Brian Cuban is, but I can be Mark Cuban's brother and get all of these fake, all of this fake adulation, all of this name fame, even if it's not, even if it has nothing to do with me and finally feel good about myself. Hmm. That is how it impacted. And that has nothing to do with Mark. We all have the obligation to create our own self identities and become happy with who we are. But I had none, Zach. I had none. I had this empty hole. So it was like an alluring kind of identity or a fetishizing of an identity that was wrapped up in your brothers. It was a way to, even artificial, it was a way to extend the cocaine high Mm -hmm. beyond the however long it lasted, right? Yeah. To pump myself up. And unfortunately, that can never, that can't sustain Mm -hmm. uh, because it wasn't who I was. I could never be Mark, uh, and I didn't want to be Mark. I just wanted the all the perks that came with it because they made me feel good, and I had never felt good before. You're talking like somebody who feels self-confident now in your own identity, like you're actualized in your own identity, um, and it sounds it seems like there's like two major divorces you had to make one with a negative self-fulfilling kind of a lifestyle or image of yourself and then one as you only being associated as with your brother into becoming more of a just grounded you and I'm curious I'm always curious about how that works out for people and how that uh, works for you. it's it's a progress I mean Especially in the age of social media, you would, I mean, it, it, for, I mean, as an example, all the time, it, it doesn't happen as much as it used to, 
But I, I get you, you know, from the anonymous social media people or wherever you get, you know, you're only famous because your brother, you wouldn't, you know, you're, you're nobody without your brother. And those things used to, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. It still happens today. And it used to bother me, but it doesn't anymore. Uh, because I've become more, and you know, you, as you build your own identity and, and that's a lifelong process. Uh, do, I, do I still have negative body image thoughts? Absolutely, absolutely. Who doesn't? Mm. There is a difference between everyone at some time or another Zach looks in the mirror and says, man, that sucks, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see, oh man, I'm having a bad, and me, that's compared to you, the hair. <laughs> no, no, I've, I've had plenty of times where I look in the mirror and uh, people oh. in the household can hear an audible, Ugh. You know. Yeah, but I, I, I look in the mirror and then you're having a bad hair day. You feel pants are a little tighter or whatever. And that's called, that's normative discontent because right. we're human. Right. Uh, what doesn't happen now is that it drags me down. And so what happened to get you to that mindset? Lots of therapy. I'm still in therapy today. Lots mm. of body image therapy, lots of talk therapy, uh, lots of different cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, so getting sober, I got sober in 12 step. But that's just abstinence, right? My path is abstinence. I embrace all paths. I know that you're not an evangelist for one method or another, no, which no, I appreciate. I embrace all paths. Yep. Harm reduction. Uh, this will piss people off. I embrace Demi's California sober. Yeah. Whatever. All I care about is, are you hitting the pillars of recovery? And are you leading a happy, fulfilling life? I don't. If you're standing on your head Perfect. and that's getting you there, I don't care, right? If you're not, we can talk about why. And, but, it, but I, I embrace all past. My past was abstinence. It had to be. One, because when I, in, in April 2007, you were either uh, in 12 step or residential treatment, there was no harm reduction that I was aware of. And only gaming therapist. My therapist was aware of. I, only, I, I was only given two options. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, but abstinence as a path. Uh, didn't cure my underlying body image issues or didn't address those. So I've, I'm still in therapy today. And, uh, I'm trying to and, heal the little Brian. I'm trying to heal the little Brian. And the more that little Brian heals, because I dragged that little Brian on, uh, the, tra the trauma, you know, the, the traumatized little Brian around on a suitcase in a chain, right? And you're dragging yeah. the little, the traumatized little child through life and packing it all in the suitcase. And the suitcase keeps swelling and swelling. And finally, the suitcase has to open and you have to cut that chain and tell that little boy that he was loved and that he is loved. I noticed with most people's um, recovery stories or whatever people want to call it, just there's both cutting ties with that, that negative story like you're talking about, um, and in your case, through therapy. And then there's prospection, like looking into the future and building on things and so I'm curious now, uh, you've written a couple of books, you obviously extend help to others. What is it that you're building on and, and looking forward to doing and, and constructing? Uh, I look forward to continuing to share my message. Uh, for me, as you might guess, writing is very therapeutic. I'm working on my third novel or my third book, which is a novel. My first two books are uh, nonfiction. My third book is a fiction novel, I'm trying hmm. my hand at that. But I look forward, I always just like to share my story uh, and pay it forward. And I don't look, I mean, now I'm 60 years old and I'm always trying, I, trying to find uh, meaning and purpose in my life. That's a little bit different because uh, I've gone through a lot of stages and now I'm in the, you know, in the final, I won't say the final stretch, that sounds morbid, but I'm not 30, right? When I was 20, I thought, oh man, 60 or even 40 is forever. Now I'm 60, where did all the years go? And I'll tell you something, Zach, uh, that has had its impact on me as well. And it's because you, I suffer from major depression uh, that exists independently of uh, my underlying uh, substance use issues and underlying eating disorder issues. So even in sobriety and recovery, I have been suicidal. Uh, I have, uh, I'm battling a major dep depressive episode talking to you because we're approaching my uh, father's, uh, the anniversary of my father's birthday, and he passed almost three years ago, and he and I were very, very close. But the irony is that is tomorrow is my anniversary, my uh, recovery anniversary on the same day. Wow. So, so wow. that is uh, kind of a uh, paradox there. What a strange, but, what a strange uh, phenomenon to, to have to grieve so, and celebrate. 
honestly, dear leader, I, I barely got out of bed yesterday. My wife died. I, I couldn't function yesterday, but here mm-hmm. I am today, right? And you, you have a toolbox. I have a toolbox, and I utilize that toolbox to wake up, not get sucked into it for days and days and days, and, and move forward. Do you remember any of the practical steps that you had to take, or the movements that you, uh, stages that you had to go through? on a day-to-day basis in like you mentioned CBT. So that got you from one stage and one sort of idea about yourself to the next or sort of better idea uh, of yourself. I don't, I, I, I look at it as a, a fluid process. Okay. Uh, a lot of the underlying body image stuff is, uh, was, it was, was difficult. I mean, it's one thing, okay, you're not going to do a lot of Coke. You're not going to take a drink. Right. Um, Prohibitions. Yeah. You can't stop your mind from, uh, it's hard to stop your mind from going places, right? Mm-hmm. Especially, I mean, everyone, I mean, how, how many, the majority of our thoughts every day are, are negative thoughts. Over half of our thoughts in a given day are negative thoughts. It's whether what you, how you respond to them. Right. And the, the process of understanding that I'm not my thoughts is still an ongoing uh, continuum. Mm. So again, it's, uh, give me, give you an example. Uh, for, it would still be difficult for me to go into a swimming pool and go into a swimming pool uh, without a shirt. I would put a shirt on. Uh, that is because to let people see me in a swimming pool. Uh, even when I was on, even when I was uh, misuse, abusing, I don't know if there's a better term than abusing anabolic steroids because you really, I don't like the term abuse, but yeah, they're illegal exactly. and I don't, I, I don't want to say misuse because they're anabolic steroids. You shouldn't be using them. Uh, use it. So when I was abusing him, I was huge, and I should have. There were some pictures out there of me. Though I was huge, and I, people would say, "Man, you look great." I, I still saw that monster in the mirror, and I would still, even then, wouldn't go into a swimming pool or take off my shirt. So there would be like never a time that you like you sought an image, but there was never really going to be an image that you finally said, "Okay, I'm finally here." Uh I don't want to put it that way because if you're suffering from body dysmorphic disorder, there is a continuum of recovery and you can lead and you can work to way, your way towards a quote unquote normal life. But I'm also don't want to blue sky it and pink cloud it and say that I don't have negative thoughts and I still don't struggle with negative thoughts, body dysmorphic thoughts, because I do. But, and there's a big but here. The thoughts that I struggle with are not thoughts that keep me from leading a productive, happy life. Right, right. So you you can you're accepting of yourself the whole of you. There you go, and that right. is acceptance and commitment therapy. Hmm. That's a different type of therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, which people, your listeners, may be familiar with. Which comes full circle because acceptance seems to have been the uh, at the crux of all of it right. from the beginning. People reach out to me struggling with eating disorders and body image issues at a wide variety of ages. If you're 25 or 30, your path may be different than me at 60. Hmm. Because at 60, I've accepted that there are certain thoughts, but they don't affect my life, right? I understand now I have the toolbox when I look at myself and, oh man, uh, I have the toolbox to know that I can shrug that aside and the thoughts come and I'm still gonna move on and continue with my day. Here's an example. My mind is part of my exercise bulimia, which is obsessive compulsive exercise for the primary purpose of offsetting calories, which I struggled with mightily. My mind still might look at a bagel in the morning and say, that's 200 calories. I have to get on the spin bike or do this to take care of that. But I know that my mind does that. And I am very careful about not allowing myself to be triggered into uh, an exercise, destructive exercise. That's so interesting because I've grappled with that too. Like uh, like the the idea of there's a food, you know how many calories it is so that there's a certain offsetting you have to do. And that that can be a very healthy thought process Unless, of course, it goes off, it goes off that, the rails. That is correct. Like, that is, when I say that, I am not making a blanket statement that that is unhealthy. Certainly not. I didn't take it We're that all way. interested in taking, people are interested in taking your bodies or whatever that is. Right. It is when it, it, is when it becomes destructive. Right. And how, you, and how you address it. 
if you eat a bagel and then spin, you know, and then go to a spin class for four hours for different, for, you know, four consecutive spin classes, then I, then it may be incumbent to uh, have some self analysis of whether that is a healthy relationship with food and exercise. People have told me that they have gotten to that point, like the more destructive point, uh, an obsessive sort of a point that they, they'll be in uh, like a staff meeting or something and people will bring in a food that they like and they'll be like bit like resentful and bitter and afraid of that food. They remember being like afraid of Kit Kats or whatever uh, because sure. they just don't want to have to, they know that if they eat it, there's this sort of responsibility that they have to now take over to just run a marathon or, or whatever that is. Sure. I found of which, that I've run, interesting. of which I've run eight. And I and not one of them was run for a good re for a healthy reason. So interesting. So you know, and so that's another thing about addiction that um, you know, I have a very broad definition of addiction. I don't know if you know Peel's work, but I pretty much align with him. And uh, people always make this. It's like they think it's a jab at me when they say, "Oh, what is running addictive to?" Because uh, I I think of things non drugs as being a addictive, and I say, "Of course it could be." Yeah. Well, what what is the definition? When we're just talking about addiction, right? Obsessive compulsive drug seeking behavior in the face of known consequences. You take out the drug seeking behavior, exactly. Obsessive compulsive exercise, obsessive compulsive exactly. this. Sure. Right. Because that is the definition of addiction. Right. Now, when we're talking about stigma, things like that, of course, things have different terms, things have different meanings. People will throw out addiction, and I, uh, I've gone on my soap when people throw out. Well, I'm body dysmorphic. No, everyone, no, no. Body, body dysmorphic disorder is a diagnosis, okay? You may be having a bad, uh, I'm having a body dysmorphic day, right? Uh, so I'm always very careful about stigma in that arena as I am about uh, addiction. So are you saying like, it's a good definer of a phenomenon, but it's not a good, you don't want to wear it? Well, we have to remember the body dysmorphic disorder is a... I, a DSM-5 diagnosis mm -hmm. that uh, devastates people, absolutely devastates people. It affects men and women equally, uh, about one, one and a half to 2% of the population, somewhere between there. Are people surprised at that when you tell them that? Because it, that seems surprising to me. Yes, the people, it's stereotyped as a woman's disorder. Yeah. And that's because people tend to think of it as an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. It's not. But... Yeah. Uh, what I don't like, and especially when I see celebrities do this, and you know, it, it, people throw it out like it's a new purse on Rodeo Drive. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, and when it's, that, I mean, we all have bad, we all have days when we look in the mirror. Like I said, that is not body dysmorphic disorder. And body dysmorphia is body, you know, that is a body dysmorphic disorder. So are we talking about a bad day? Or are we talking about uh, you're in a day where you just don't feel good about yourself, or are we talking about a diagnosis? So I think we have to be careful because there is stigma attached to that. Right. And so you don't say, I drank too much last night, so I have an alcohol addiction or something like there that. There you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So can we go back to, I'm still surprised that you cleared it up a little bit by saying some people think that they think of this disorder as um, simply eating or not eating, and that has an association toward more dominantly female behavior, it seems like, at least the association, at least what people think about. So what is it, can you give, I, maybe even a little bit more than you have, why do you think it is that this is such a, an unknown that men suffer with it? Do, do you think it's because men generally don't talk about it as much or something else? Sure. Uh, I mean, we look at eating disorders. I mean, they're very still very stigmatized for men. And again, they're not the same, but I'll because people tend to think of them in the same bailiwick. I'll talk about it. Uh, we're between 35, 40, maybe even 50% of all those with eating disorders with male, but only one in 10 males will seek treatment because it's still stigmatized as a, uh, a female disorder. And that has, and that's a historical stigmatization, st uh, stigmatization, however you say that. That's, that's historical stigma, going back to Karen Carpenter, right? Uh, brought in, bringing eating disorders into the pre-digital national spotlight but also kind of cementing it as a quote unquote female disorder because we didn't have the information dissemination. And for a long time, Zach, the, uh, the seminal studies uh, put the male suffering at about 10%. So that is what everyone went with, 90% female, 10% male. We now know that that's not true. Mm. So I, there are a lot of different prongs to that. 
But I think if you look at it as a package, it was you know, only the Karen Carpenter came out and the people, the only people who came out felt empowered to come out were female. And it's just kind of the building blocks of it. And that's changing, but it's still much more stigmatized for men. And body dysmorphic disorder is exponentially more stigmatized for men. Uh, and a lot of, one of the reasons too is it's very difficult to treat. There is no real uh, bright line where we can say you're cured that I'm aware of. That's, and that discourages people. Right. People, people like looking for like an easy cure to everything or like a, well, simple, people, a simple answer, let's just say. People don't, people, somebody's not leaving, hasn't left the house for a month because they envision they have a little blemish that covers their entire head, uh -huh. their entire face. So they don't want to feel that way. And yeah. it is a body dysmorphic disorder is a complicated diagnosis. And there are not a lot of, uh, when you look for treatment, finding treatment is difficult. It's expensive. Now, there are a lot of therapists who understand cognitive behavior, acceptance and commitment. And a lot of the underlying therapies to treat body dysmorphic disorder. But there are very few who actually specialize in treating it. And uh and body and it and it's difficult. Uh, my therapist and I, he didn't understand it. It was a, it was a joint exploration. What do you think would be more beneficial to have as a therapist? So a therapist that is tr specially trained for for that kind of disorder, or a therapist with maybe less formal training in that arena, but who is just an excellent listener. Uh -huh. Oh man, I don't. Here's here's the problem with answering that is I I'm not a therapist, right? <laughs> That's uh, fair I enough. I don't want to, uh, to to tell people what I believe could have a validity that I shouldn't have, right? Every situation is, yeah. I don't want people putting a label on that that I I don't have that kind of uh, validity. I'm not a therapist. Mm -hmm. I can say for me, uh, my therapist is very familiar now, but uh, when people come to me, I can tell you that. I give them all the options, uh, and there are very there are some very good therapists who understand who specifically understand body dysmorphic disorder. And there are different types of questions you have, people ask. Therapists have to ask a lot of shame based questions uh, that a traditional therapist may not understand or may not have in her full, her or his toolbox. So, I think you should explore all options, and I think you should certainly explore. Uh, those who specifically uh, specialize in it. But the problem is, is there aren't a lot. Is it going to be covered by insurance? Probably not. Uh, so there are a lot of barriers. And so what happens? You don't seek treatment. You sit at home. And there is a very high correlation to uh, suicidal ideation. For you, what's been more important? Um, sort of the prohibition of certain behaviors you want to extinguish or building sort of a lifestyle that usurps your, your need to do those that's things? Easy. Uh, that's an easy question for me. It's dealing with the underlying trauma hmm. has been, uh, I'm a big believer in adverse childhood experiences as a driver of, uh, as a, a strong driver and strong correlating driver of, uh, of destructive behaviors and mental health issues later in life. Until I healed that little boy, and I'm still working on it, until I healed that little boy who didn't felt love, uh, that would, to me, that is key to my abstinence those key to my abstinence, the key to my uh, view of myself and my reflection, all of that, all of that. Uh, so trauma, the trauma core for me was key in my recovery. So getting, getting a sense of who you are starting from memories yeah. of yourself has been... That's right. The, the snapshots, dealing with the snapshot. Uh, I, went, I walked into 12-step. Uh, you, you know what's interesting, Zach? When I, when I walked in a 12-step and sat in that room, April 8, 2007, uh, crying and just smelled, sitting in the corner, just miserable, I didn't walk in that room with this, I'm an alcoholic uh, mindset. I walked in that room with the mindset that if sitting in this room will allow me for the first time in my life to wake up, walk to the mirror, birthday suit naked, and love the person I saw, hmm. that would, I would sit in that room. It was not about whether I was an alcoholic when I first went in that room. And, uh, but it certainly became about abstinence as I continued therapy 
and uh, and continue to build abstinence. But if I, I believe that uh, if I hadn't continued to work on my adverse childhood experiences, my abstinence path may have been a lot uh, bumpier than it was. So uh, first, I want to say thank you so much for just being able to share that, like that really vulnerable space in your life and you're doing it publicly and I know that you're reaching out or people are reaching out to you and you're helping a lot of people and you're writing and the things that you talk about and this is helpful this is really it's really interesting talking to you and, and about your life so thank you and I'm wondering where um, if people want to either reach out to you or if that's not something you're interested in and people just want sure. to access I, your I work mean, what I are ways where people can I send people I'm always, I always encourage people to reach out to me because people, people suffer, suffer shame, especially, I mean, around drugs and alcohol, but especially around body image and eating disorders. Uh, it's much more acceptable to talk about addiction than it is for, uh, to talk about having an eating disorder or body dysmorphic disorder. So you can reach out to me at Brian with an I at BrianCuban.com. You can reach out to me. I'm on Twitter at BCuban. I'm on LinkedIn. So I'm every, you know, I'm pretty, uh, available. My, uh, website is, www.briancuban.com. So you can reach out to me in all of those spaces and I will respond. Um, so I have a Patreon. And so people who are paid subscribers have asked, they ask questions that I get to, they get to hear only. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be willing to answer it. You can plead the Absolutely. fifth on any of these things.